Be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Thus, the noble Judas made atonement for the dead, that they might be freed from this sin. Lord our God, give peace to the souls of all the holy and just men who have died in the Lord. Welcome, friends. I'm Father Clement Machado, and we continue our journey into Purgatory, the Dogma Explored. The last episode, I talked of the doctrine of Purgatory after giving a historical context or parameters as to its development in Christian thought, in Christian revelation. The Council of Trent, especially in June 19th, 1547 wonderfully is able to synthesize the Catholic understanding, the Catholic doctrine on purgatory, especially defining it in response to those very objections brought by the first Protestants, such as Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, Zwingli, Knox, as well as others. It states during the 25th and last session because the Catholic Church instructed by the Holy Spirit and receiving light from the Holy Scriptures receiving the ancient tradition of the Fathers has always taught in its sacred councils and teaches authoritatively in this ecumenical council that there is a purgatory and that the souls of purgatory that have not had satisfaction for their sins or still being attached to their sins because they need purification are in that state as they await God's glory. The Council goes on in several places to state again in this last 25th session of that great Council, it states those souls in purgatory are helped or assisted by the suffrages of the faithful, especially by the holy sacrifice of the altar or the mass, the Eucharist. The Holy Council prescribes to bishops to keep vigil to watch over the doctrine, the true veritable doctrine on purgatory received from the Holy Fathers and the Holy Councils to be preached with zeal so that Christians may be educated, instructed, and that their belief and adherence will be enlightened with such preaching. We need the masses to be instructed on such a doctrine. Let popular preaching be sober. Let it be filled with true, authentic doctrine so as to avoid any useless superstition and that true, authentic piety may grow for the edification of the Christian peoples. Therefore, bishops will not permit that points of theological uncertainty or opinions be propagated in such popular teachings or preachings, lest they scandalize the faithful. The Council also goes on to state in Session 6, Canon 30, if anyone states that a penitent sinner that has received the grace of justification offends so much the majesty of God and in being justified at the same time is so remitted of that act or that sin and that the obligation of eternal pains is so erased, so removed, that he does not have an obligation of the temporal debt, either in this world or in the other, purgatory, before entering into the glory of heaven, may he be condemned. 
Now, of course, the conciliar teaching can appear to be convoluted. It is a very dense paragraph. It does not sound poetic, or it doesn't appear to be a literary gem. However, the council, within a paragraph, is condensing some major points of Christian teaching. What it is saying that a person that appears to be saved, and may be saved, may be headed to eternal glory, headed to heaven, may not have done complete satisfaction for their sins, and thereby such a person may need purgation. Oftentimes, we have the first Protestants and Protestant reformers who talked about regeneration. There are Protestants, especially in the last century, that have objected to purgatory by saying, well, when you are born again, then you are set free. There is no burden. There is no expiation. You have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is enough. It is enough for Jesus to remove the complete entire guilt of our sins. However, he does leave to us. He does, through his grace, move us to expiate for some sins, to expiate for some of the burden of the sin. What are the consolations and sufferings of purgatory? The councils have never specified the exact nature of suffering, purgation, or consolation. However, we know that those in purgatory are already destined for heaven. Therefore, they are already saved. They have faith, hope, and love of and in God. They are consumed by the Holy Spirit. And as they are being purified from the last spots of sin or inclination to sin, as they're making up temporally their sins through the blood of Christ, they always do so in the context of an intimate friendship and personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, all those that Jesus Christ loves, the assembly of the Christians here on earth as well as those in the glory of heaven. Thereby, Understanding that context, what is the suffering? The suffering is a soul has left this world, a soul is as close to God as he's ever reached or experienced, and at the same time he sees God, yet is not able to take full possession of the heavenly inheritance. That creates suffering, because he knows he's so close, yet seems to be so far. A soul willingly understands and wishes to be purified so that it is able to face God. It is able to face God completely purified with a robe that has no sin, no wrinkle, no spot, no stain. Thereby, the soul in purgatory is not like the damned or those without any hope, those that are not in God's friendship, those that have not been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In the context of this friendship, like any friendship, when one realizes that one must reconcile with one's friend, one must somehow contribute to repairing a relationship or from a past hurt that I caused my friend, I wish to do it out of friendship. And so the souls in purgatory wish to be purified, wish to have the fire of God's love come and remove anything that might inhibit the fullness of God's, of Christ's reign in their souls, in the very fabric, in the very tissue, in the very core of their being. That being said, we know the first thing is a certain deprivation of God's presence face-to-face. Only face-to-face. 
That will be seen and experienced in heaven. In the meantime, they have faith, hope, and love. The more a soul is close and within striking range of God, the more the soul is tormented by its own hunger, its own longing, its own pining, its own pangs for the Lord God. And that is why it suffers. You can imagine that an athlete, such as a sprinter, as it is coming towards the finish line, finds every step excruciating and the more excruciating as it closes in, as he approaches the finish line. It is that last mile, that last stretch, that last sprint that is the most painful, in which the athlete exerts all his energy, focuses and channels all his power, all his talent, all his aptitudes, puts it to the disposal of getting to the finish line. For a soul that has left this world, the finish line is heaven. It is God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it realizes it is closing in. It is on the last stretch. It is doing the last mile, the last few yards. It is approaching. And so that very exertion is causing it pain, purification. The body is already tiring down through the sprint. And the soul, the, spirit, the spiritual athlete, as well as the sports athlete, is trying to even go down right to this very last reserves, physical and spiritual reserves, to come to the Lord our God. Of course, all this is being done in God's presence and through grace. The spiritual athlete, the soul, in its departure from this world and ascent to God, is being drawn, is being moved, is being transported by God, all at the same time being purified by the Lord Himself. It is a work of the Holy Spirit, a work of sanctification. It is bringing to closure that which has already been destined for the soul, eternal life. At times we experience uh, hunger and sometimes hunger becomes excruciating. Hunger can even be very poignant the more we smell food. The closer that we realize the dinner hour or supper hour is approaching, the more all of a sudden our body begins to react. Our mind begins to release the hormones for our body and our organs to receive nourishment. So there's already a longing, a preparation. The closer that approaches, the closer the senses smell food, it is within the vicinity of food, the more the appetite is exacerbated, is increased. Therefore, that what happens on the spiritual level for the soul. There's an exasperation, an exasperation, exacerbate of the soul, a heightening of its appetites so that it can come before the Lord. Oftentimes, the suffering of the soul in purgatory is one in which it realizes how there were so many missed opportunities of God's grace and God's mercy, right from infancy to natural death. And the soul has remorse for the times that it did not respond to the impulse of God's grace, the offering of His mercy. That is another suffering, a suffering of the conscience, a suffering of the inner soul, of the heart, purifying the person. The suffering is caused because a soul so close to God is so sensitive. It has become increasingly sensitive as well as sensitized to God's love. And so now it is seeing in the fullness of God's life, his whole or her whole life, and the person realizes, oh my Lord, how you were so present, even in the most hidden, obscure ways, my Lord and God, and how I resisted you, how I was overcome by the temptations of the world, the flesh or the devil. And so the soul, in experiencing such a rush of love towards God, who is love, 
experiences that suffering of not responding to love. St. Teresa of Avila states, love is repaid by love alone. The suffering of the souls in purgatory are those of two lovers, the soul in love with God and God in love with the soul. And so the pains are not pains created by ambition or arrogance or fear or desperation, but rather that of love trying to somehow respond to God's love, God's mercy. Another suffering is that of the soul. Now we know the soul is of the spirit. It's a spiritual reality. Therefore, is purgatory a place? It is more likely a state. A soul separated from the body is not subject to the confines of material space. It can go through spaces. It can be in this place and at the same time be in another part of the world. It is not constrained by temporal reality. Yet the soul, because it was a part of a fleshly material body, is somehow related, is somehow connected to our material world, to our visible creation. Because the soul resisted in the flesh, God, somehow the soul is affected, has affected the material universe, has affected the body, has affected time and space. And so the soul in its suffering is somehow affected by time and space in a way that God alone knows. It is a place because a soul is not in every place. It is not infinite, such as God. God is infinite. It is everywhere. He is everywhere in the known physical universe, and at the same time, he is much beyond that. The soul is not constrained by time and space. However, it is not infinitely everywhere. It is somewhere, and therefore we say it is a place but not like the time-space continuum that we on earth know. It is of another order, not of an earthly order. The soul in purgatory, because it has experienced our universe, because it has sinned in the world, is also somehow purified by the material world, by the material creation. And that is why fire has often been raised by great writers, great theologians, Christians, as being that suffering caused to the soul in damnation, in hell, and also for the just, for the saved, being purified. We know that physical fire cannot touch a spiritual soul. However, somehow, God is able to make the spiritual soul subject to a purification, even material purification, in a mysterious way. It's as mysterious as having a soul being connected so closely to my body or to your body. How can a spiritual soul be so closely connected and can even suffer through the body? Mysterious. Yet some part of that purification happens in that transition from this world to the next. St. Catherine of Genoa brought and highlighted another aspect of purgatory. It is not just one of suffering, but one of consolation. We know that they're saved. The souls in purgatory are very conscious of the fact they're close to God and getting ever closer. They realize that they want to be pure. They don't want to have any excess baggage from earth as they approach the Lord God for all eternity. They know that they are confirmed in their salvation, in their grace, by the blood of the Lamb. They experience tremendous joy because now they fought the battles. They have fought the wars. The war has ended for them. They are not now subject to either the flesh, the world, or the devil. They don't have to battle daily against sin or sinful inclinations in their lives. They are free from that. And their focus is that journey towards the God. They can see the Lord in a way 
so abundantly clear that was not rendered possible while they were in their earthly dwelling place, in their earthly home. These joys of purgatory are able to offset an indescribable torment that a soul would experience. That is what makes purgatory so different from hell. Hell has no hope. They have no hope. They're despairing. And at the same time, they don't want to repent. They want to remain. They prefer their own torment, their own hell, their own selfish ways. The souls in hell would rather turn in on themselves and suffer than to open themselves up to God's life-giving spirit, to God's mercy. It is pride that is at the root of that. Whereas the soul in purgatory is saved, has opened themselves up to God's mercy, to God's goodness, to God's supreme power. There is faith, hope, and joy in the midst of all this expiation and purification. Therefore, the souls in purgatory are not alien or foreign to God. Rather, they are God's greatest friends. We have St. Catherine of Genoa, as well as St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Robert Bellarmine, in his great work in the 16th century in the middle of the Catholic Counter-Reformation, stating, declaring in De Purgatatio, how there is suffering compatible with joy. We just have to look at our earthly existence in which there is a mixture, a mixed bag of both suffering, pain, sorrow, as well as joy, glory, goodness, all in this life, all happening sometimes in the same work, in the same domestic duties, in the same families, in various relationships, places, times, and conditions where we can experience one instant tremendous sorrow, disappointment, and two moments later, joy. Sometimes there are those two sentiments that seem to bear upon us. We can experience the sorrow, we got bad news, we've heard the passing away of a dear friend, and at the same time, we can have joy at the fact that somebody who was hostile to us, somebody that was my adversary, has now become my friend. We've both reconciled mutually with each other. Both suffering and joy can coexist in the same human person at the same time, at the same moment. Look at our Savior Jesus Christ. He had a tremendous sorrow for sin, for wickedness, for evil, for injustice. Even as he was preparing that evening in Gethsemane, he suffered his agony, that tremendous suffering. He sweated blood and tears. Yet at the same moment, the Gospels do not show a man that is going unwillingly towards the cross or to accepting his mission. We find Jesus is accepting from start to finish, never doubted, was always focused. So while his soul was experiencing the sorrow of sin, at the same time, with such great love and joy, was willing to embrace the cross, was willing to even die for us, to bring us eternal life. Both sentiments coexisting in Christ, coexisting in us to a certain degree, much lesser degree, and of course, upon leaving this world, before entering the heavenly patrimony and homeland, we can still experience both. So there is both consolation and suffering in purgatory. We have various saints that discuss purgatory, that have had visions of purgatory. They don't create, manufacture new doctrine. Rather, their own personal testimony confirms for us Christ's teaching. It is a witness. We have Christians that witness to God's presence or mercy in their lives, and we hear their witness at church or in the home. They don't reinvent the gospel. So too the saints in their personal prayer life, in their personal histories, give a witness of how God is working 
a God of justice, a God of love, both at the same time. And so purgatory opens us up to the fact that God wants justice. At the same time, God wants to create and establish us in love. Until we meet again next time, friends, let us ask Almighty God to keep us in His love. Oh, Jesus Christ, remember us and the souls in purgatory who you wait for and wish to embrace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.